Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Baptist Renewal podcast. I'm Matt Emerson, and I'm one of the directors at CBR. I'm joined today by Luke Stamps, who's also one of our directors at CBR, and Tyler Whitman, who is Assistant Professor of Theology at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. He's also one of our fellows at CBR. And the Center for Baptist Renewal is a group of Orthodox Evangelical Baptists committed to retrieving the great tradition for the renewal of Baptist faith and practice. If you enjoy what you hear today, we invite you to check out our website at centerforbaptistrenewal.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at at Baptist Renewal and on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Baptist Renewal. And as my kids would remind you if they were creating their own YouTube page, don't forget to subscribe and press that like button and tell your friends. Uh, in today's show, we're going to talk about the next book in our 2021 reading challenge, which is uh, the Summa of Thomas Aquinas's Summa Theologica. So, uh, Tyler, you wrote your dissertation on doctrine of God in Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth. And so why don't we get started by you telling us a little bit about your project and, and what got you interested in studying Thomas? Yeah, uh, the, the book has the slightly misleading title of God and Creation in the Theology of Thomas Aquinas and Karl Barth. So if a lot of people think it's about cre creation, um, it's actually more, much more about God's relation to creation. It has very little to say about the doctrine of creation itself. But yeah, you got started on that because it's just kind of, well, I mean, anything you say in theology has to do with God's relation to creation. So what better place to kind of start thinking than that if you're planning a lifetime of, of, of thinking through the theological themes? Um, I mean, it's no better than many other places, but it's just where I kind of wanted to start with. Um, so your first book, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your first book is basically God and the World. Don't you think it's a little ambitious? <laughs> Uh, it's not as ambitious as Christology, um, but uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Shots fired. Uh, um, yeah, what got me into it, though, was, you know, my supervisor was a, uh, a very careful reader of Bart. I had, um, I, I wanted to be, you know, somebody who could, who could read Bart intelligently because he's, um, he's obviously very influential and important and so forth. Um, so I wanted it to incorporate him, you know, wanted to take advantage of that, but also I wanted to do something with Aquinas because I got into Aquinas from reading, uh, Protestant scholastic authors, um, from reading Francis Turretin and John Owen, um, <clears throat> and you kept just seeing these themes that they were leaning on. You would see them almost always quote Aquinas favorably. Um, the same could be said for any number of other uh, similar you know, scholastics. I was reading some of John Davenant's stuff just the other day, um, and he, uh, he, he was quoting Aquinas favorably. You know, this is a, kind of a common theme, so I just figured, well, if, if, if these guys cut their teeth on people like Aquinas, then I should too. So that's kind of what led me back, and, um, and I, was, I was reading him really, I think, preparing to maybe ride on one of those other figures, but I just never got out of, got out of reading Aquinas and, uh, and found him very, very helpful. Great. Thanks for that. So if you don't mind, uh, tell us a little bit about Thomas himself, his life, uh, and, and, you know, give us a, an idea of what he wrote, because, you know, we're, we're reading the Summa of the Summa, and then, uh, you know, of course, many people, when they think of Aquinas, all they really think of is the Summa, but he was much more prolific yeah. even than that, which is pretty outstanding. So tell us about Thomas and, and his other works. Yeah, I mean, uh, the best place I think maybe to read about Thomas, if you wanna, if, you, if readers wanna fund kind of introduction much better than I could provide here would be by Dennis Turner. Uh, he has a book called uh, Aquinas, uh, Thomas Aquinas, A Portrait and um, uh, that's a really good book that gets you into the person of, of, of Aquinas and the kind of main themes of his thought. But uh, yeah, just generally, I'd say he was a, I mean, this is the 13th century, so this is the 1200s. He is a, a Dominican friar. Uh, Dominicans are the order of preachers. So when you see a Catholic theologian's name and they have OP after them, it's the Ordo Predicatorum, it's the order of preachers. Um, founded by St. Dominic, um, to be a, a 
basically a, a, a very intellectually well-equipped group of um, um, priests who can defend the faith um, with the Bible, right? Um, and and, and, all, and all, all the tools at their disposal. Um, Dominic had run into the Albigensians in the south of France, these, these kind of uh, sort of Manichaean types, and they um, <clears throat> were unwilling to listen to the, uh, you know, the fancy kind of uh, church officials who came to them with their long retinue of servants and, and everything, you know, and, and their kind of uh, their pomp and circumstance, because they, they, they believed that, you know, followers of Christ should be uh, not ostentatious, they should be poor, and they also believed in, you, know, you should get your stuff from the Bible, so Dominic thought, well, we need to be poor and read up on our Bible to, to answer these people. This is this is very very uh, schematic, by the way, in, in general. But so that was the order, that was the founding of the order, more or less. Um, that was kind of their their original kind of um, um, you know mission. So uh, Thomas came from a um, a fairly uh, well to do family. Uh, I think his his parents <clears throat> probably had um, hopes for him to be in uh, to kind of climb the ladder a bit and to be influential um, politically and so forth. But he uh, surprised them by becoming a, um, a Dominican friar and, 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 and basically committing to a life of, uh, of, of the mind and of prayer and, and, and service. So he went to the University of, uh, of Paris um, where he met uh, and studied under Albert the Great, um, another famous Dominican theologian and Albert noticed his, uh, his qualities and his gifts. And it wasn't long before Aquinas, um, you know, was, was teaching himself, right? Um, not teaching him, not teaching himself, but he was himself teaching. Um, and yeah, he, he taught at a variety of places, you know, probably most famous for teaching at University of Paris, but he taught all over the place. He taught, taught in like little Dominican studia. He taught in, um, in, you know, in, in Naples and in other areas, but um, he, he, he engaged debates when he had to, but that led to a very diverse kind of corpus of writings, all right? Um, so most people know of him maybe because of the Summa Theologiae, the Summa of Theology, but he wrote um, commentaries on philosophical, important philosophical works like Aristotle's Metaphysics, um, and, and other things of Aristotle's, um, even like Neoplatonic texts. Um, he wrote um, a commentary on some stuff from Pseudo Dionysius, the Areopagite. He wrote lots of biblical commentaries, it's something a lot of people don't know uh, when they hear Thomas Aquinas in a kind of, you know, uh, textbook setting. There's a lot, a lot of biblical commentary from him. He wrote full commentaries on the Gospel of John, on the Gospel of Matthew. Um, he wrote uh, several Old Testament commentaries. He wrote a commentary on every single one of Paul's letters. And he thought that Paul wrote Hebrews, so that includes Hebrews. Um, so lots of rich biblical exposition animating his thought uh, alongside these sophisticated philosophical works as well. And so all of that kind of, and then he would, he would also write things on particular topics that students were interested in and, and uh, he had occasion to lecture on and, and kind of argue about. So about the soul, about truth, about the incarnation, uh, about virtue, um, about divine power, these kind of issues. So his, his, his writings are quite diverse in that respect. So there's a little bit of something for everybody. Talk, talk a little bit about his other summa, the summa contra gentiles. How is that different, similar to the, to the summa theologiae? Now, I haven't spent a whole lot of time in the um, the other summa, um, but <clears throat> there's I, I I do recall there's some debate about the, um, the the specific genre right who he's writing to. It's much more of an apologetic work, so some people think that he was writing um, with um, Islamic theologians in mind, and so he is appealing to lots of common philosophical ground in the first. Um, couple of books specifically where he's dealing with the nature of God, what can be known about God from the, about God's uh, invisible attributes, right? Um, from, from the things that he has made. So there's a process of, of theological um, and philosophical reasoning 
um, based upon the principles of, of philosophy, but also based upon some, you know, telltale signs of not only that, like, you know, what's given in nature to be known about God, but also some, some parts of the Bible as well. I mean, he's, he's quoting from scripture throughout uh, that as well, but he tends to kind of stay clear of, steer clear of specifically hardcore Christian distinctives like the Trinity and the Incarnation until book four. So it all comes at the very end, whereas in the Summa Theologiae, things are kind of structured a little more, they're kind of distributed a little more evenly from, from, from the get-go, you know, this is a work of Christian theology, um, whereas in the other one, it is more of an apologetics work. So that's, that's some of the difference in, in the genre. And the Summa Contra Gentiles is not really um, structured just like the, the other Summa. Um, Summa Contra Gentiles has chapters, you know, where he treats of, of individual kind of, kind of topics and so forth. The uh, Summa Theologiae is made up of um, a first, a second, and a third part. And then it also, in, in each part, is made up of distinct questions. And those questions have sub questions underneath them that are called articles. And so it's just a different kind of structure that you have to kind of get used to, but we can, we can maybe talk about some of that later. But that's one of the one of the main differences there. One apologetic, one catechetical. All I heard from all of that was Aristotle, philosophy, no Bible, Catholic. <laughs> if you don't understand Matt's sense of humor yet, uh... If you're not watching the YouTube, maybe yeah. you can't see his facial expression. <laughs> that was sarcasm. Hashtag sarcasm. Yeah, that's great, Tyler. Thank you for that. So let's talk a little bit about the the Summa, the and you know the the version that we recommended on the reading challenge is a summary. Well, it's not a summary, but it's it's the major portions or what some have chosen to be the major portions of the the, the larger Summa. So let's talk a little bit about. Um, just the kind of macro structure of the Summa and then how we should understand this weird question, answer, rejoinder, said contra format. Um, Luke, you want to talk a little bit about the, the, the overall structure and then get us into those specifics? Yeah. Yeah, so it might be worth just talking about each article because I think that's where students, my students anyway, when they first um, read the Summa get tripped up because it sounds like he's saying one thing and then it sounds like he's saying something else. Um, and so he, 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 he begins with objections <clears throat> to the view that he's eventually going to defend. And I think that's, if you sort of understand that, you can understand the content of each, each article. So he'll, he'll begin by saying something like, it would seem that, uh, you know, Christ did not assume a human soul, right? And so you know right out of the gate what Thomas is going to say is Christ did assume a human soul, do you see? So whatever he begins with is an objection to the position that he's eventually going to defend. So the, he begins with a, a series of objections to his view. Um, he, he then cites an authority uh, against those objections, often from scripture, um, often from what he calls the philosopher, which is Aristotle, and but just as often from one of the church fathers, especially St. Augustine. He's, he's heavily dependent upon St. Augustine uh, throughout the work. So he'll cite some authority, uh, and then he has, um, so that, that section is, he, he introduces it by saying, on the contrary, cite, citing some authority, and then he has a uh, the respondio, I respond that, where he gives his position. After he states his position, then he comes back to the objections, which can be, you know, two, three, five, six, seven, depending on, you know, the issue. And he will provide responses to each of the objections and, and demonstrate how they don't um, defeat, you know, his response in the middle. So if you, if you just wanted to scan an article and say, what's this gonna be about? Re read the, the, the question at the beginning of the article and then read his, his response. I respond that, and that will give you a sense of what he's going to argue. Then maybe you can work back through uh, the objections so that you can see you know, the, the way that he's gonna respond to those. But uh, it, it takes a little bit of practice to get used to that whenever you're just starting out. But I think once you do get the hang of that, then you can sort of see where, where it's going. So I don't know, did you guys wanna add something to that? <laughs> 
No, I think that's good and helpful. It's it's definitely a format that's not as familiar to modern readers, so it, it takes some getting used to. And so in terms of getting a general sense of the Summa, you know, one of the things that's included in both uh, the Summa itself and then the Summa of the Summa that we've recommended is uh, at least the bulk of uh, the, the questions on the nature of God. And, you know, Luke, you, you and I have written some things on modern Trinitarianism. Tyler's obviously very interested in the uh, comparison and contrast between, you know, Bart's doctrine of God, Aquinas' doctrine of God. So, and, and this conversation um, is one that's happening in the wider, not just evangelical context, but in academic context as well, which is the, the relation between God's oneness and his threeness. Uh, and there, there has been the suggestion that where modern theology tends to begin with God's threeness, that is, he has three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, earlier theologians, and, and in particular here, Thomas Aquinas, um, began with God's oneness. So maybe we can talk for a few minutes about uh, that structure of Thomas's questions on uh, the nature of God and how starting with God's oneness or threeness might make a difference in how you uh, conceptualize the doctrine of the Trinity. Yeah, I mean, before, as we get into that, I do, I do just want to have a, a caveat to say that um, we, we would not want to suggest uh, something like the, the, the old de Reignan thesis, as it's sometimes called, uh, which was uh, a view put forward by a certain theologian, um, I think late 19th century, early 20th century, I can't remember the exact date, but basically suggesting that there's a sharp division between Eastern Trinitarianisms and Western Trinitarianisms precisely along this axis, that basically Eastern Trinitarianisms, think about the Cappadocian Fathers and on, begin with the threeness and move towards the oneness and Latin or Western Trinitarianisms begin with the oneness and move towards uh, the threeness. Um, and that, that su supposed distinction between Eastern and Western Trinitarianisms prevailed for a long time in the historiography of the patristic era and, and the Christian tradition more broadly, but has been, um, has, has sort of suffered severe blows, I think, in more recent uh, scholarship of the patristic era in particular. So that, so that scholars these days, I mean, you still have remnants of that old day Reignan thesis, but you, you scholars these days tend to see much more continuity between Eastern and Western Trinitarianisms so that you have, I know this is, this is going a bit far afield from Aquinas, but it's important that we just sort of clarify what we mean when we say that he begins with the oneness, right? Um, but both the Cappadocian Fathers, for example, and uh, St. Augustine, so third, fourth century, I'm sorry, fourth, fifth century um, theologians, East and West, end up saying largely the same things, right? I mean, about, you know, the oneness of God, the, the unity of the divine essence, the only thing that distinguishes the three persons are their eternal relations of origin to each other. So, again, sometimes people have made that mistake of seeing their seeing this sharp divide. Now, there are differences between Eastern and Western views, especially around the, the Filioque clause, but they don't lie along this axis of where you begin, so to speak. But anyway, I, I just wanted to clarify that before we go any further. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's right. That being said, I do think there is something to the idea that in, in modern theology, you, you do have an emphasis on um, God's threeness and what if you want to if you want to use something else besides begin with then fine yeah. but uh, it, modern theology certainly seems to be more interested in the distinctions between the persons in light of their distinct supposedly distinct personalities uh, yeah, that's right yeah which, so, which is not yeah. where thomas starts right and 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 that that is where people end up marshalling that thesis is, is in order to say we should retrieve the Eastern view, which is, is supposedly more social. I mean, this is how it was uh, used in the 20th century anyway. 
um, so that we're trying to retrieve this more relational social view where the persons are seen as kind of distinct centers of consciousness that are interacting with each other. Um, I'm just trying to suggest that that's what, not what anyone would have said um, uh, in the fourth century or in the medieval period, so far as I know. That's a, a, a modern invention uh, and, and a departure from the great tradition on this point. But there is also, I think, some uh, wisdom in beginning with, I'm putting this in scare quotes if you're listening, um, where the Bible begins with. I mean, you know, this is kind of where uh, um, Kate Sonderegger's work has been a helpful corrective to some trends in modern theology to say, well, you know, the, the Old Testament begins with the, you know, the, the oneness of God, the Shema, you know, and there's, there's, there is a kind of ordering there that makes sense that we begin with canonically we begin with the oneness of God it's only in the incarnation that God clearly reveals his tripersonal nature of course God has always been tripersonal but in, in terms of the order of knowing and the order of God's revelation to us he seems to communicate his oneness first and then this threeness I don't know what do you think about that Tyler is there is there any anything to that canonical or revelatory ordering yeah I think so <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I think there is, um, you know, just wrapping up a book actually with uh, with a friend, uh, Bobby Jameson on the doctrine of the Trinity and uh, it gets into some Christology because they're not really, you know, that distinct, you know, d d um, in terms of the kind of things that they're talking about. But we kind of just found ourselves ending up, we had to talk about some stuff about God's unity before you can kind of get other things off the ground before you can really make sense of who Christ is. For instance, you have to understand who he is against the background of the Old Testament, not just in terms of the messianic promises, but about the very, um, the very being of God, right? Um, or divine identity, as it's, you know, kind of in some of the New Testament scholarship these days. Um, basically, who is God, right? Who and what is God? And because Jesus claims to be God, so that's going to make a, any account of his person, who he is, um, you, you know, is only intelligible against the background of everything the Old Testament says. And so, um, yeah, whether or not that's the actual motive in Aquinas's, um, you know, kind of division of labor, as it, as it were, um, is something I'm, I'm not entirely certain of. I, I, I uh, you know, people sometimes, that, you know, treat me, ask me questions as if I'm a Aquinas scholar, and I'm, I'm not, you know, like, <laughs> barely written about him. You, uh, you know, it takes maybe about a decade to become somebody who knows what they're talking about with Aquinas. So maybe it is. I, I just couldn't say. Um, I have to admit my ignorance there. But, um, but certainly with the uh, stuff that you're talking about with Theodore de Rignon, you know, there is a, uh, it was a, a certainly a, a polemical emphasis of his because he wanted to do what he thought the Eastern Fathers were doing as opposed to the Western Fathers, you know. But even in the early 20th century, you have people who are immediately saying, nah, this doesn't really, um, this doesn't really do just, justice to the texts. And this is not very careful historiography. Um, so there has been a steady stream, you know, um, of people throughout the whole 20th century kind of sharply disagreeing with with Peter de Reunion, but it's definitely become prominent, you know, uh, in the past 20 to 30 years and uh, in some very influential English speaking patristic scholarship to kind of push against that. And uh, because a lot of English speaking systematic theology was starting to make a lot um, of mistakes that really reflected that kind of, um, that, 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 that's, that scheme, you know, of East versus West in terms of fundamental differences here. I think for Aquinas, you know, you have to understand his doctrine of God isn't just the, the stuff on questions basically 2 through 26 of the Summa Theologiae. Um, that's his discussion of what he says, that which pertains, right, to God's substance, right, or God's one essence. And then beginning in question 27 through 43, he discusses that which pertains to the distinction of persons. So it's not like he's talking, in other words, about there's this doctrine, there's this, there's this one doctrine called the doctrine of God, and there's this other doctrine called the doctrine of the Trinity. You know, that's not it. It's just that the whole, the, his one doctrine of God, right, goes from basically questions two through 43. And then it, you know, because it's God, it's the most important thing we talk about in theology. It's the center around everything, you know, around which everything revolves. Well, it just finds its way into everything else he says. 
but I heard, uh, you know, Fred Sanders has a way ha has a way with uh, with words, and he kind of puts things pretty uh, uh, memorably. And I remember him at ETS several years ago saying that if uh, the, the doc, you know, God is big, and uh, you know, the, the doctrine of God is big, and so um, sometimes we have to kind of take two breaths, you know. Uh, <laughs> And and so uh, he says it's so big, you know, that, that, that we that we sometimes divide it into that which concerns the unity of God, that which concerns the distinction of persons. And um, I think at its best, that's all that it, that's really going on here. You have to talk um, about that which pertains to the unity of God. You have to talk about that which is distinct amongst the persons. And in Aquinas's reckoning, this is actually something he's really good at drawing out. Um, and it's something you already find in the uh, in, in the Fathers, you find this particularly um, in Basil of Caesarea, and, um, and then Augustine makes it very kind of systematic, and it, this distinction that I'm gesturing towards becomes even more um, refined in the Middle Ages, but it's the distinction between what we would call um, God's essence and the persons, or the, uh, and, and basically that reflects two ways of talking about God. So we say certain things about God that we say equally of the Father, Son, and Spirit, and then we say other things about God that only pertain to the persons, you know, like only the Son is the Son. We don't say that of the Father and the Spirit, but the Son, Father, and Spirit are all equally blessed, right, um, or simple, you know, or, um, or all-knowing or something like that, right, or all-powerful. So these, uh, these, these essential predications belong to all three of them. The distinct predications, though, you know, pertain to what distinguishes the persons from one another. So that's what he's up to when he's kind of dividing that labor. He's just kind of, you know, uh, he's, he's basically articulating who God is um, on those two registers that you have to kind of constantly be traveling on. The other, the other mistake to make, I think, and, and then I'll shut up. The other, the, other, the, other, the other mistake to make is of thinking of, everything that pertains to the unity of God as somehow um, uh, more accessible, right, or, or exclusively accessible. Um, I mean, what I mean is that you can get to it by way of natural reason. You don't need revelation to figure out, in other words, that God is all-knowing or God is uh, omnipotent or something like that, right, um, or, or one. Uh, Aquinas is pretty clear in the very first question of the whole Summa. Is he says, look, you know, yeah, we're going to be using a lot of philosophy and stuff like that and what follows. But if philosophers had just, you know, um, been about their own business, right, everything that they figured out about God and said about God, um, you know, is uh, there's some good in it and there's a lot of bad, right? And he's like, and, and for us to pick out what's bad would take a long, long time, right? And we need some kind of criteria with which to sort of sort out the wheat from the chaff. And, and I think that's what Revelation does in his theological scheme. So he's, he's, yes, he's plundering the Egyptians, as Augustine would say. He's taking from Aristotle. He's taking from Neoplatonist sources as well. He's, um, he's, he's a kind of Aristotelian and, and a Platonist in one. He's doing his own thing. So he's taking from these sources, but he's doing so always with a mind on scripture and how to teach scripture and how does this help him articulate how the faith is not irrational. Yeah, that's good. I mean, that is, it points out another um, critique that's common that people have against Thomas Aquinas, that his nature grace distinction is sort of the, you know, the seed of all the problems in the world, basically, <laughs> you know, that this, this distinction between what we can know by nature, what we know by grace, um, that becomes, I mean, this, many people have made this argument over the years, it sort of, sort of becomes this fissure between the sacred and the secular or between natural theology and and uh and revelation and so on so i don't know what would you guys say in response to that is that a fair criticism of aquinas does he set the ball rolling that gets us to all of the problems of the secular world I feel well, like I'll, I'll just i'll just put it this way uh in seminary we had to read a fairly famous i think maybe it's not anymore but fairly famous book by a 20th century writer that lays everything at the feet of thomas aquinas 
And uh, I read it. I was like, man, didn't know that. Thomas Aquinas, what a joker. And we were, <laughs> we were reading this in a group of students. Uh, it, was, it was at our church, actually. So it was it's just a few students at the church. And we read this book. And everybody's like, man, that was great, whatever. And the one guy in the room who was a philosophy student and had been a philosophy student and, you know, sort of had background and all these things that this, this writer was sort of papering over was like, yeah, I hated it. And I thought, huh. And he explained why he didn't like it. And at the time I had no idea what he was talking about, but uh, you know, I, I think that the situation is quite a bit more complicated than is popularized by some modern day apologists. To lay everything at Thomas's feet, I don't think is quite fair. Yeah, the more uh, the more socially acceptable um, kind of blame game these days is to kind of blame everything on Duns Scotus or on Descartes, you know, depending on who you're, who you're talking to and, and, and what the evils are, right? Um, or even Kant or something like that. Um, you know, th those kind of narratives have some kind of initial um, uh, value or plausibility as long as you're not looking at the details and you just want snappy answers to things. You know, um, I, I'm generally resistant to all those kinds of narratives because I think they, they fall apart um, when you look at the details, right? Even the kind of blame game about Duns Scotus is responsible for why we don't believe in truth anymore or something. I don't know. <laughs> The thing is, you know, uh, it, it, but it's just nonsense. If you read Duns Scotus, um, you know, uh, he collapses the critical creature to things. And it's nonsense. He, he doesn't do that. You know, um, he, just, he just doesn't. And, and I think a lot of our Protestant forebears uh, understood this because they could freely appropriate from Scotus as much as they could um, Aquinas. They saw them as both, you know, valuable resources to them, right? People to be learned from. So, uh, yeah, any and all narratives where you try to just kind of wrap up everything in a neat bow and say, well, look, there's this fundamental distinction behind everything called nature and grace. And one person got it wrong a long time ago, in my opinion, and that explains all the things that I don't like. Um, that's a pretty intellectually lazy thing to do, and it's uncharitable. And but a, really a lot of sophisticated people do make those kinds of arguments, though. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, uh, well, you know. sophisticated people aren't exempt from making, mistakes, right. you know, like, right. um, yeah, so, and, you know, uh, so. You can spin a yeah. yarn, though. I mean, you, you can spin a yarn about uh, a decline narrative that's been going on for 1,200 years. I mean, you know, some people go back to the investiture controversy of the 12th century, you know, and, and it's just like, really, you think that there, there was an intellectual movement that started a millennia, a millennium ago that sort of has this unbroken, you know, causal connection all the way down to, you know, Twitter or whatever, <laughs> you know, like may maybe not. That's exactly you know? right. <laughs> it's, it's also an inflated view of the kind of, um, of the way that ideas function. I mean, it's true that ideas have consequences, but I mean, if you live long enough and you uh, <coughs> have enough relations with normal human beings, you will discover that it's usually equally true that consequences go looking for ideas, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, 500 years ago, there were like some peasants sitting around waiting with bated breath to see what would come out of Oxford or Paris so they could get on with like what they thought about the economy or something, you know, and news came down one day, one of them said, Duns Scotus denied, you don't know, universals or Occam denied universals. And everyone's like, ah, let's go cut the king's head off. You know, like, I just don't... So it's not how it works, right? It's just things are a bit more complicated than that. So, um, you know, we, we just kind of usually the, those forces of change, you know, how do we get from, um, you know, theologians in the, uh, you know, Reformation, reading scripture carefully and trying to organize their societies and so forth and their governments in accordance with, you know, the what, what they saw as the kind of uh, rules governing magistrates and all that kind of thing. how do we get from that to like you know the mob rule of twitter these days where people don't you know people only believe what they see online and what they see online is usually not worth believing um you know uh, uh you know well I, I don't think it's because of what something some philosopher said somewhere in, in a you know a dusty this, study 
just to briefly just to briefly illustrate the point of how precarious this kind of thing is uh at the in the introduction to milton's paradise lost in the barnes and noble classics edition um the 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 train uh, the the editor says uh that milton was highly concerned with the the way that uh economics had shifted from a barter-based, uh, goods-based system to a monetary system where money stands in as an abstract sign for the more tangible real goods. Uh, and so, he, he, you know, this, this editor's point was Milton was resisting some of the trends of modernism uh, in, in Paradise Lost. Whereas I just finished a book uh, a couple of days ago by an author who I love and respect uh, that that sort of uh, characterized Milton as endemic and, and perhaps even seminal in some of the movements of modernity. You know, so you have on the one hand one person arguing, "Oh, Milton's resisting modernism." On the other hand, Milton is modernism sine qua non. You know, so. Uh, those things get really dangerous really fast when we try to do that. And the same thing is true of Aquinas. And I don't, you know, I don't, I, well, I do know, uh, there's, there's a particular writer who I'm still not gonna name because I don't want the fanboys mobbing me on Twitter, but um, you know, I do know how it became popular, but there's this myth that Aquinas is responsible for all of modernity's ills. And it's just not, it's not feasible once you dig into the details, like you said, Tyler, so. Let's uh, let's talk about another myth related to Aquinas, which is that he doesn't care about the Bible. All he cares about is Aristotle. So, you know, lots of people have made the argument, uh, and Tyler, you actually referenced it earlier. Question one, uh, you know, basically, how do we know? And, and Thomas points to scripture over over uh, really standing over philosophy as the source of knowledge. Uh, but then, so the argument goes, and the rest of his doctrine of God, especially, uh, and as you pointed out earlier, that's through question 43, where's the scripture? It seems like he's just aping Aristotle and, and not referencing the Bible. So where's the Bible in Thomas, if anywhere? Is that fair to say that he cares more about Aristotle than the Bible, et cetera? Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, so... Um... You know, one of the reasons there's a lot of reasons he's he's engaged with Aristotle. A lot of people are around this around this time. Um, a lot of the uh, the works of Aristotle have been translated into Latin at this point. They're made widely available. Um, Islamic philosophers and theologians are engaging Aristotle, so they are just um, you know in the university there are these scholastic discussions happening that require engagement with you know what's what's up and coming. Well, um, Arist that's not anything new. I mean, theologians have been engaging Aristotle from the beginning, right? Is that like how everybody's obsessed with CRT right now? No, I have I, I don't know what that is. So, um, but uh, but with, but with Aristotle, um, you had some people, for instance, at the University of Paris, like you know, Aquinas is kind of called back to the University of Paris at some point in his career, right? And it's because there is this uh, this kind of young hothead kind of theologian there who has a a kind of uh, following about him. And he is just a thorough Aristotelian. And you can't be a thorough Aristotelian, right, through and through, and, and a very good Christian theologian at the same time. And so uh, Aquinas knows this. And I think a lot, of, a lot of people are hoping, well, we're going to bring Aquinas up here, and he's going to kind of tell everyone, yeah, Aristotle's bad for you. You know, lock it away, right, and pick up your Bibles and just pray more or something, you know. <laughs> and what Aquinas ends up doing is he kind of out Aristotle's the Aristotelians. He digs deeper into the source because he realizes, no, there's actually something good here. There's a lot of good here. Uh, it just matters that you have the right controls on your use of it, you know, and that you know what you're what you're what you're doing here. And this is how theologians have always engaged uh, philosophy, um, because, I mean, theologians have always understood themselves as, as philosophers. The early Christians understood themselves as philosophers. They just understood Jesus as a philosopher. Um, my friend Jonathan Pennington wrote a book on this recently, right? Jesus says, um, what is he, what, what is it? Jesus, the great philosopher or something. I forget the, name, the exact title of the book, but 
uh, if you're listening, go buy it. It's a, it's a good one. Um, and uh, yeah, philosophy is just a way of life, um, of, of thinking about life, the universe, and everything. And so theologians were doing that, but with Christ at the center of everything. So they were willing to engage other, other schools of thought. I mean, Paul does this uh, in, in the Bible. So there's biblical warrant for doing this, and, um, and Christians have always understood that. So he's engaging Aristotle um, for uh, reasons that are as much contextual as perennial. Um, you know, there's always a need to engage um, the uh, current philosophies to see what's good and, and, and to leave out what's bad, but also because the controversies usually crop up around these philosophical ideas and you have to know uh, the limits, right, of, of, of any given philosophy. But um, as much attention as he gives to that stuff, you know, his, his primary duty in the university is to be a, uh, a teacher of the sacred page. Okay, that is his, his kind of, if he had a title, as it were, right, a kind of job description, it was to teach Holy Scripture. And he did. He lectured on Scripture. So not many people know about it, but I think one of his, um, one of his greatest works is his commentary on the Gospel of John. It's just a beautiful work. Um, and, um, you know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, people kind of get, it's easy to get intimidated by Aquinas because you think, well, I don't know. I mean, this is a guy who was writing hundreds of years ago in Latin and he was a scholastic theologian and I've heard a lot of scary things about them. But, um, you know, a couple of years ago, my wife was preparing a, a lesson for, uh, for her, um, for the, the, the women's ministry at, at, at her church. And she was puzzling about the stuff in the gospel of John and and she was like, can you bring me home some books? And I was like, well, I've got uh, this stuff and I've got that stuff. And she said, bring me the Aquinas, right? <laughs> I was like, okay, so I brought her that. And she actually got the most out of that. So, um, and she's, you know, I mean, she's always talking theology because that's just what we're always doing in our house, but she's not like a professionally trained theologian or anything like that. So just to, to, just, just, just to say, he's, he's readable and he's accessible um, if you want to think deeply. And he usually thinks deeply about about the text of scripture. So even as you start reading the Summa, you can't get very far without noticing biblical allusions and biblical questions coming up very often. So for instance, I'll just give you one example. Um, you take this, the, the third question, the doctrine of uh, divine simplicity, the idea that God does not have parts, nor can God himself be a part of a larger whole, okay? Um, that is, 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 is what is involved in talking about divine simplicity, just in a nutshell. Well, uh, he opens the question up, right, by talking about how, um, about uh, uh, various issues, right, concerning God, had, you know, there, there might maybe be parts in God and so forth. But the way that the whole question is structured, you have several, several articles, and, in, and in, uh, in, a, in a key moment, he starts asking questions about whether God has a body, and he starts quoting all these Old Testament passages that seem to suggest that God has a body or has body parts, like a hand and eyes and a nose and um, you know so on. And um, <clears throat> so you can see already that all this kind of discussion about whether God has parts and so forth um, builds up to helping us to interpret what this tradition is always recognized, or we speak about the tradition, as long as you understand the tradition has diversity in it. But um, traditionally, Christian theologians have always recognized that there is anthropomorphism in the Bible, right? The Bible speaks about God as if he were a man, or as if he was a human person, sometimes as if he were an animal. Uh, there are theriomorphisms, as they're called. Well, Aquinas gives you a kind of uh, reason to understand them as anthropomorphisms in other words, right, and not as literal depictions of, of you know, God with a bod, right? Uh, you have, uh, these are anthropomorphic statements because God is not made up of parts. Um, and why is that important? Well, because ultimately it helps you to understand the doctrine of the Trinity, right? Without divine simplicity, you don't really have a coherent doctrine of the Trinity. Um, the Fathers recognize this, uh, Aquinas knows this, and so um, you know, you get to the, the doctrine of Trinity, and what are you able to then say when you realize that God doesn't have parts, and, and you read Scripture accordingly? Well, you understand, you can say what Scripture says about the, the Father, Son, and Spirit, that they are all one God. There are three distinct persons that are one God. They're not parts of God. 
right? So it's not that the father is part God, maybe like a big part, and then the son is like a pretty big part, and then the spirit's like somewhere in there, you know, like, it's, you know, you don't have parts in God, you have persons, and um, so anyway, I, there, there are biblical pressures and concerns, either coming from the revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament, or even from the Old Testament's kind of, you know, uh, anthropomorphic language, and the fact that God is the creator of all things, and he's not like the idols of the, of the nations, and so forth, all of these things kind of um, converge, and lead him to, to have to confess something like divine simplicity. So, and I, th I think it's important for readers who are un relatively unfamiliar with Aquinas to, to realize that often those biblical allusions and also allusions to uh, historic, traditional, whatever word you want to use there, interpretations of scripture or quotes from previous theologians who were themselves interpreting scripture, often those allusions are relatively understated in Aquinas. So sometimes it'll be obvious and there will there will even be a citation in the text um, but a lot of times the you know Aquinas uh, quotes or alludes to or um, you know references someone else or a text in scripture without being explicit about it and uh, you know the, the other thing to say about uh, his theological method and especially his use of scripture is that uh, you know, like the, the example you gave regarding simplicity and its rela relation to the anthropomorphisms in the Bible is that uh, when Thomas, so in that question, right, Thomas lists all these scriptural examples, and then he says, do these mean that God, God has parts, essentially? Um, and then the scriptural quotations after that dwindle to almost nothing, Right but he's still engaging with scripture in answering his questions about scripture. So I think people get tripped up because they see all these citations in the objections, and then they don't see a lot of citations uh, in the rejoinders. But what we need to, I think what we need to understand is that in those instances, the rejoinders are responding to his own enga previous engagement with scripture and, and really a lot of times it's through engagement with other people's engagement with scripture. So, uh, you know, it, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, and we, we talked about this in the beginning, people unfamiliar with Aquinas. Uh, it's a, it's definitely not the way people write today. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's unfamiliar territory in that regard. Some of the language is new. Um, but just because we don't understand immediately what Aquinas is doing, doesn't mean that it's fair to say that he's relatively scant in terms of his biblical engagement or that he only cares about Aristotle or whatever. That's actually not what's happening. And you have to be a careful reader uh, to understand that. Luke, you have anything to add on Aquinas in the Bible? Yeah, I, th I think part, part of what you're saying there is that you kind of have to keep reading <laughs> to see the bigger biblical logic of what he's doing. That if you're just going looking for proof text, like stuff in parentheses, right? You, you do get some of that, right, in his Sade Contra sections. You'll get some scripture citations where he assumes, like, if, if the Bible says this, we have to go with that. You know, whatever these objections may point us, you know, maybe pointing toward, we have to go with what scripture says. But a lot of this, a lot of the, the kind of um, the architecture of a particular question, which, again, is made up of several articles, is leading, is leading ultimately to a better way of reading the biblical text. And so, you know, one of the areas that I've read a lot in, in terms of Christology, um, there are all kinds of fine distinctions that Thomas and the other scholastics in the medieval period are making about the will of Christ, for example, this area that I know the best in Thomas. Um, and that it can seem sort of like nitpicking to us, like, you, you know, there, you have like these the distinction between the divine will and the human will, even with the human will, you have the rational will and the will of nature and, the, you know, the you know, the, the a will and a wish going back to, you know, previous authors and all of these fine distinctions about how we understand what the will of Christ is, the human will of Christ. And it can seem kind of like, you know, philosophical and theological nitpicking until you realize that what Thomas is doing, and again, the other scholastics as well, is they're trying to help us read the Gethsemane narrative. Like, what do we do when we see Jesus in Gethsemane saying, not, mil, not my will, but thine be done is he is there 
a conflict between the divine will and the human will? Is there a conflict within Christ's own human nature between his reason and his sensual, you know, his sensuality, his, his, his you know, sort of fleshly desire not to die? Um, is, is there, you know, how do we, how do we think of, of contrariety or conformity between the, the, the two wills of Christ? Did he fear? Did Christ fear death? Is, is that an appropriate way to talk about what happened in the garden? So ultimately, all of those fine distinctions that may not be quoting Bible verses are the sort of necessary theological apparatus uh, based on the totality of what Scripture says that is, is, has to be in place for us to understand the text of Scripture. So if, if you're going looking for proof texting, you're probably not going to find that you're not going to be satisfied because he's going to quote Aristotle in one state contra and he's going to qu quote the Bible in the next one. You might think that those are on equal, you know, equal footing in terms of authority. But that's not what he's doing, right? He's, he's giving us a deeper logic of how to understand and interpret and synthesize what the scriptures say. And, and he, his audience would have known the Bible way better than we do. So like, all, all of the Bible is sort of assumed. The, 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 the Summa is not uh, meant to be a kind of work of exegetical theology. Again, as, as Tyler's pointed out, he's, he's writing commentaries, he's teaching, he's teaching scripture that all of that is, is assumed. And now he's thinking about these theological categories of how do, how do we, uh, again, sort of synthesize all the scripture says as, as a, a way of helping us be better interpreters of scripture. Yeah, and I think we're just, again, I think we're unused to that kind of theology and evangelicalism. Uh, scholasticism uh, is not popular uh, in terms of uh, method in evangelicalism, much more popular is, is what we call biblical theology, tracing narratives, looking at themes, this sort of thing. But what Thomas and the other scholastics are doing uh, is what, what we've termed theologic. It, it's, it's, asking, it's asking theological questions and the logical entailments of the answers that you give to those questions. And even the, even the logical entailments of how two particular Bible verses fit together uh, or, or, or two or more Bible verses fit together. So I just think it's an important mode of theology that we have in a lot of respects lost and, and many are trying to recover it today, but uh, it's been out of fashion for quite some time. That doesn't mean it's wrong in and of itself uh, just because it's been out of fashion. So I think all those things are important. The other thing to, to I would say about, um, you know, Thomas's use of scripture and uh, looking at the whole scope of his argument uh, is, and this is again, a larger point that I think Luke and I have talked about before probably, <clears throat> which is, and it's not, it's not unique to our conversation about Aquinas. And it's simply that today, and we mentioned this with Darren Yon earlier, people like to, I think, do a kind of control F version of historical theology, where if I can, if I can search a PDF or ccl.org or something like this and, and find, you know, where such, so, somebody says, you know, this phrase, Therefore, my position has always been held in the history of the church. That's not doing historical theology. Neither is reading um, even, you know, part one of the Summa and then saying, well, there's not enough scripture here. Therefore, Aquinas likes Aristotle more than scripture. I mean, that, both of those things are piecemeal readings of historical figures that aren't capturing the reality and totality of their thought. And so, I, you know, <clears throat> I think Aquinas is wrong about a lot of stuff, okay? I mean, I, we haven't really talked about anything, to, you know, uh, critiquing Aquinas yet. But, I mean, I, I think he's wrong about tons of stuff. I'm not a Roman Catholic. And I think some of those pieces where I disagree with him have a lot to do with methodological concerns um, and ecclesial concerns. At the same time, the caricature of him today, especially among conservative evangelical theologians, needs to be challenged. And, and, and I know there are people who have been challenging it, but needs to be continued to be challenged. You're here. Boom, roasted. Agree, <laughs> roasted. Well, that settles that. <laughs>
No, I mean, it, it's it does offer a, um, a challenge, yes, but the challenge is an opportunity much more um, than a challenge, right? It's a, uh, it's, it's a chance to engage with a source that almost every Protestant before you, right? Every Protestant theologian before you has recognized is worthy of deep engagement. So, uh, I mean, the same could be said about um, a figure like Scotus, you know, um, or, uh, or Bonaventure. Um, it's definitely true of Augustine and, you know, um, um, and, and, and Gregory of uh, Nazianzus and Reganisa, you know, and, and, and these guys. So, yeah, I mean, it just depends upon, look, what do you want to uh, become a, um, a theologian and someone who is, who, who carefully considers um, the views of others and who carefully considers what is the truth of things? Or are you just looking for, like you said, kind of control F, uh, you're, you're, you're looking for, um, for quotes, you know, to kind of back up what you already believe, or are you looking to kind of look at the truth? right which may line up with some of the things you believe and it may not right uh, i think it's true for all of us so yeah and just since we are a baptist podcast it's worth mentioning that and on a number in a number of places in john gill's body of divinity he quotes aquinas and other schoolmen scholastics and and it's not uh it's mostly positive i mean sometimes he'll quote the scholastics to, di to differ but often it's not often he's reading these guys and defending views that they did, you know, defending, you know, what, what sort of passes these days under the moniker of classical Christian theism or whatever you want to call it. Um, but defending the simplicity of God, the impassibility of God and so on that are associated with, with Aquinas in a more scholastic view, but also the broader Christian tradition underneath Aquinas. Uh, so even in our own Baptist history, we have, I mean, I think it would be unfair to say like Gill is a Thomist necessarily, but he's he's definitely reading, interacting with Thomas and and often citing him favorably. Yeah, that's good. Same thing is I don't, I don't know if Keach cites Aquinas, but he certainly is steeped in the broader uh, sweep of classical Trinitarianism. And and you know, Thomas wasn't reinventing the wheel with with what he says about the doctrine of God. Uh, he, he's trying to both sum up and be clear about and also relate to the philosophical trends of the day, the doctrine of God as it's always been taught in Christ church. So good. Well, we are coming up on the time. So as usual, I'll close us with the grace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.